All right. Anyway, I, this this talk is a fairly short talk. I cut out a lot of stuff that I had presented to other groups, and I shortened it because I think virtually everybody on this meeting is familiar with WinLink, and I don't need to go over what is WinLink and radio email and composing a message. I think everybody, oh, everybody, knows how to do that. If you if you don't know what WinLink is and you haven't used it this is not the right talk for you. I, I should give another talk on that, be an introduction to it. But I'm just going to focus on a few features which are not the most common features, but they're important for merged communication and also talk a little about why when we had this trouble before. What? Somebody see something? And, and focus on some features that aren't real common that I think you need to know about for MCOM. So let's, let's get into it. Historically, WinLink started out providing a lot of service for the maritime community. And there are still maritime sailors who use it by, for sure. But the number of people doing blue water sailing these days is a lot fewer than there were, let's say, 20 or 30 years ago for a number of reasons, expensive and a lot of younger people don't want to take a year or two out of their career. So the shift in usage of Windlake has really been from maritime towards emergency communication. Uh, we are developed, uh, the development is really driven by user input and experiences during incidents and exercises. I try to participate in every exercise using Windlink that I can. And I, I think 95% of the exercises where I participate, I think of some feature needs or some something I can change to make it more convenient. So the, the exercises are very important. And if you use WinLink during an actual incident or during an exercise and you think of something which would make it more convenient or you know, there's some issue which is uh, maybe awkward, uh, let me know and I'll certainly consider that for a future enhancement. Uh, this, this is a... Uh, a a map showing connections during a 24 hour period back in October 2019. <clears throat> and you can see that the, uh, the, the message links were all over the place, all over the country and out of the country as well. Uh, a lot of going to Puerto Rico at that time, but across a big, uh, big volume of messages right to the, the mid, mid south. Uh, as well as going out to the West Coast and a big cluster out in the Northwest. <clears throat> there are roughly 2,500 active RMS stations, that's RMSs worldwide, includes VHF, UHF, oh, roughly 25,000 active users over a period of 90 days, and in the ballpark of 50,000 messages transferred every month. So it's a pretty darn active system. Uh, this is a map showing current HAM PACTOR RMS stations. There are, of course, a lot of these also support VARA and other modes. There are some stations which don't support PACTOR but only support VARA, and they're not on this map. I just focused on PACTOR here. <clears throat> uh, these are VHF, UHF, RMS gateways, and, so, you know, of course, a big cluster of them around here and all over the country and around the world as well. <clears throat> this is the uh, shares, uh, RMSs, shares operates. They don't operate on ham frequencies. Uh, they operate on NTIA federal frequencies that are government controlled, not by the FCC, but by a different organization. So they don't have the same rules to play with, play by that hams do. Uh, they can do things like sending encrypted messages that hams can't. And the, the number of shares RMSs have been growing very steadily. Uh, when, when I finish my presentation, Steve can talk about the number that have added recently. But you can see they're pretty well scattered around the country. And uh, almost every week, Steve will tell me that a new shares RMS has popped up somewhere or another. Uh, as I think most of you know, the, there's a relatively new a sound card protocol called VARA, which has become very popular. And it's the reason why it's very popular. The reason is that it's inexpensive and also very fast and very good. This is a chart that, uh, prepared by one of the WinLink development uh, members. 
the, of actual measurements using an HF uh, noise or a signal, uh, signal channel Im simulator where he can inject varying lengths of amounts of noise to reduce the signal to noise ratio and measure the speed at different times. <clears throat> if you look over there, the orange curve is uh, VARA, the registered version of VARA operating in its wide mode. And you can see when you have really good signal to noise ratio, a very clean signal, VARA is faster than Pactor 4, which is pretty amazing. But as the signal to noise ratio declines, <clears throat> then it drops below Pactor 4, but it's still above Pactor 3 until you get down to pretty miserable conditions, a signal to noise ratio of 5. And then it drops below Pactor 3. So <clears throat> for most conditions, unless you're in really, really poor uh, signal to noise ratio, uh, VAR will outperform Pactor 3. And down at the bottom, you've got RDOP and Winmore, which you can see are, which never get very fast and uh, have essentially pretty slow performance across the, from very good to very poor conditions. And they're about the same Winmore and RDOP. So the bottom line is that VARA is an amazing protocol. It costs seventy seven zero dollars to license it and open it up for full speed. Uh, well worth seventy dollars is one time fee for a lifetime uh, license key, and you're getting, uh, in some cases, better than Pactor 4, but almost always better than Pactor 3 performance out of it. You just need a signal link, or if your radio has a built-in sound card, uh, like most new HF radios have, then you don't need any, any additional hardware at all. Uh, this is a table made up by Hilton Dean, W4GHD, uh, about VARA FM uh, that we're adding to our uh, BHF, UHF, RMS is around this area. <clears throat> and uh, in this case, what he did was show the time to transmit a 28K Word document as an attachment. And if you start at the left there, a 1200 baud packet, it took four to five minutes to send that 28K uh, Word document. 9600 baud packet cut it from between two minutes uh, to 30 seconds. And then when you got to bar FM that is unlicensed, you haven't paid the $70. It's about the same as 1200 baud packet. But when you license it, then 1200 baud VARA gets it down to 36 to 55 seconds. And then when you go to bar FM wide 9600 baud, it gets down to 15 to 18 seconds. So once again, bar is an outstanding protocol, both on HF and FM. And by the way, if you do pay them the 70 bucks and get yourself a registration key, that same registration key works for the HF and the FM versions of VARA. So $170 payment and you've got both of them. Okay, so why the heck do we need HF radio and WinLink? And, you know, here we are hams and you know, think about, you know, there are a lot of things you do as a ham, contesting and rag chewing and so forth, but focusing on emergency communication, why does the world need HF radio anymore when we've got all sorts of other options? Cell phones, of course, are quite reliable and, and great coverage. And there's a, a new federal cell phone based system called FirstNet for first responders. Uh, there's iPause, which is a federal alerting system. It's like the Amber Alerts. Then there's satellite systems and, of course, internet. So with all that, why do we need HF and WinLink? Because of hurricanes, ice storms, earthquakes, all the other things that knock out everything else. You know, certainly a classic example would be Puerto Rico after the hurricanes went through there. You know, there weren't any cell phones operational in Puerto Rico after that. All of the public service radios were knocked out. Internet was knocked out. They were in, in bad condition, and HF radio was the primary means of getting communication in and out of the island for a good while after the hurricanes raged through there. And WinLink was used extensively. There were two teams that went down. The first team was dispatched by the ARL, and they spent a couple of weeks there using primarily WinLink uh, with WinMore. Uh, they didn't have Pactor modems, and they, even with WinMore, they were extremely successful. Uh, they sent literally, I mean, I, uh, like in the range of 500 messages out and 500 messages in during the time they were there. 
And then a second team went down sponsored by Shares organization and they did use Pactor and they were also there for a couple of hundred, a couple of weeks and uh, sent messages or many Winlick messages also from the island. This is a picture of a cell phone tower in Kentucky. I forgot the date of this. It was, I don't know, gosh, maybe uh, eight or 10 years ago. And you can see that the ice completely covered it, knocked out all the cell phones, knocked out the public service radio. Uh, Bill Jorgensen and David Wolf from TEMA went up in a four-wheel drive vehicle to figure out what was going on because they lost communication. And one of them took this picture and sent it back by a wind link from a portable station in their vehicle. And you can see what that ice did to that tower. Now, it's actually worse than it looks because the, the weight of the ice bent the bent all of the parabolic dishes down so that even after the ice melted, <coughs> the dishes were pointed down off the ground on the ground and towards the ground. And uh, they had no cell phone coverage until the teams could get out and realign all the, the dishes to point to the next tower. So it was quite a catastrophe. But during all that, Wood Lake and HF Radio continued to work. So yeah, we have an important role to play in emergency communication. This is a statement made after the Puerto Rico hurricane disaster, uh, Department of Homeland Security, or the FCC rather, sent out a request for comments about performance of HAMS and the value of HAMS in that incident. And this was a submission by, I believe it was the director of the Department of Homeland Security. If it wasn't director, Steve can correct me later. But the question was the value of volunteer amateurs cannot be, or the answer, the response from DHS was the value of volunteer amateur operators cannot be overstated. DH comments filed. So DHS said, in addition to the direct services provided by amateur radio operators, the indirect services of technology development, operator training and support of the Shares Winlick network, among others, makes amateur radio an indispensable component to our national capability to prepare for, protect against, respond to, recover from, and mitigate against all hazards. So this is a statement from the Department of Homeland Security, not just some ham. And he goes on, he says, um, going forward, should efforts be made to increase the use of amateur radio services in connection with the planning, testing, provisioning of emergency response and recovery communications. And the DHS submission said, yes, said we asked the commission to review those aspects of part 97 of their rules relating to emergency communication, including operational and technical restrictions, which would limit utilization of new technologies. And that would, uh, that would, that comment would cover, for example, the restriction on Pactor 4 and possibly expanding the, the bands or the frequency range the, available for automatic operating stations. So they, the, the hams that served in Puerto Rico are very much impressed the Department of Homeland Security and they uh, encouraged increased uh, use and support for hams during emergency operation. Now there are lots of ways we can use ham radio in emergencies and Winlink is certainly not the only way and not necessarily the best way for all situations. There's nothing wrong with voice uh, you know, and certainly uh, the first thing you can do is throw a wire up and get on the radio and just give a voice report, and that's fine. But when you're operating where you have to send reports and requests for medicine and other information, uh, digital modes really work best. If you've ever tried to send addresses or send lists of numbers over HF radio with noise using phone, it's exceedingly difficult and very error prone. I've, I've done it. It would be a good exercise to try. You know, give us a list of 20 numbers, maybe eight digits each, and see how successful we are sending it by phone, HF uh, phone. It's, it's hard. It really is to get it right. But with Windlink, uh, you can guaranteed send it with 100% accuracy because it's being sent digitally and the protocols used all do error correction and retransmission if necessary using an ARQ uh, protocol to guarantee 100% message transmission. And, and honestly, this is just absolutely essential for emergency communication. 
if you're operating at a shelter and they give you a list of medicine to order and you put in the, the, the medicine order number, some sort of a catalog number, and you screw it up, well, instead of getting a delivery of penicillin, you may get a delivery of diapers. So you got to get it right when you're dealing with emergency communication. Uh, the same thing if you're calling for a lifeline to pick up an injured person and you send the latitude and longitude, the latitude and longitude gets corrupted. Uh, they may go to the wrong state, the wrong city. It's, they're not going to get to your location unless they've got the correct latitude and longitude. So accuracy is important. Reliability is important. The, the Winlink system, because of its redundancy, uh, multiple CMS uh, central servers plus the distribution of RMSs has been up uh, better than 99.99% over the last 15 years. And I'll be happy to compare that with any other system, including Amazon Web Services or anyone else, cell phones, your internet, Comcast, whatever. 99.99% is darn good. So you can count on WinLink. You can count on messages being 100% accurate. And you can also use WinLink, of course, to, to send regular emails. So if you're trying to reach someone that doesn't, who isn't a ham, or isn't using WinLink, you can always just send a regular internet email via WinLink. Let's see, one, a really important point here, if you get down to near the bottom of the slide, a communication system is only useful if the recipient can receive the messages. Well, obviously that's true. I mean, that's what communication's about. It's not just, it's not a, you know, solo activity. There are always two people involved if you're communicating. Winlink is used by many agencies and NGOs, so it's a method you can use to get the, the message to a lot of people. But even if they don't have a radio, you can always send and receive internet email through Winlink. So interoperability, that is the ability to communicate with other people, is vital for MCOM. It's vital for any communication. If someone comes up with a brand new radio device and they say this is absolutely the best communication protocol that's ever been developed is better than anything else and you know here I want you to try it out and you say well okay, that's great well who can I use to communicate with this and they say well right now you're the only person in the world that has it but it's really good well if you're the only person that has it I don't care how good it is you just have no value because you can't communicate with anybody you've got to be able to talk to someone else to make it communicate and with WinLink, you've got lots of options, including internet email. So I think you could make the case it's the most interoperable radio system in the world when you include the radio, uh, radio to internet email bridge. Uh, I'm going to skim over this. I think most of you know it, but it sends standard email format messages. It has time independence because you're sending into a store and forward system. That means that both ends don't have to be on the air at the same time. That's really important for com emergency communication when uh, the stations may be moving around or may have uh, temporary power issues and can't be on all the time. Uh, they can always connect later and pick up messages that have been deposited for them. It works well at most power levels. You don't need a big amplifier to make WinLink work. Uh, it's not limited to station to station propagation because you can send it into any RMS you can reach and then the, the receiving party can pick it up from any RMS they can reach. Has a lot of built in ICS standard forms, also has automatic message generation and I'll tell you about that in, in a minute. <coughs> I want to just run through and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on each one here. Just several features that are important for MCOM and, uh, you know, if you've used WinLink just to send and receive messages and haven't experimented with it much, you might not be familiar with some of these features. So I'm just going to run through them and uh, prompt you or give you a little uh, teaser to help you get going. And then maybe you can get into WinLink Express and uh, play with these features and learn how to use them. One of them is requesting a message receipt when you send a message. If you look up there, this is the message composition screen and up there where it's got, uh, you see a checkbox that says request message receipt. I've checked that. That flags the message so that when it's read on the other end, 
a pop-up box appears and the receiving party uh, has the option of generating a message receipt which is composed automatically for them it's very fast and then that receipt is sent back to you uh, this is what the receipt looks like for a message I sent and uh, it shows uh, the date and time the message was uh, received and read by the other end uh, it gives some information about the message to confirm uh, this is the one you're talking about a message ID the subject and so forth so it's a good it's a it's a good proof that the message wasn't just sent but was actually received by the party uh, when you know I don't know if you anybody's participated in an actual incident but in, in significant incidents, let's take the Gatlinburg fire, which is a good good example of that, which occurred a couple of years ago. After the Gatlinburg fire and things settled down, uh, lawyers started popping up all over the place and lawsuits started getting filed. There's always uh, an aggrieved party in, in any kind of incident like that who's looking for someone to blame and, and pay them money. Well, uh, it that got to be quite a mess for the communication people. They ended up having to transcribe a lot of uh, phone conversations that were recorded uh, for depositions, and it was it was a mess. A message acknowledgement is a really nice thing to have if you're Rado. Uh, that proves that not only did you send the message, but it was actually acknowledged by the receiving party. So if you say, you know, we need a order of penicillin and it uh, doesn't arrive, uh, they, you know, rather than blaming you, you can blame the party that didn't respond to the message because you could at least prove with a message receipt that that message got there uh, and was actually opened by the party on the other end and they sent an acknowledgement. So uh, it protects you, helps protect you uh, after you've been in an incident and then questions come up as to, you know, whether communication was effective and done properly. There's, you can also set a bunch of defaults for messages. This is back on the sending screen. Uh, just to the right of the checkbox for requesting message receipt, there's a set defaults button. If you click that, you'll see a screen like this. I'm not going to go through all the options, but you can see that there are a number of options you can set which get applied to all messages by default. Uh, for example, specifying a default carbon copy address. Uh, in some incidents or some exercises, uh, the COMEL may request that a copy of all messages be sent t to a particular address because they want to have a master log of all communication. So you can set a default carbon copy address in here and then every message you sent will automatically be copied to that address. Uh, there are other checkboxes like defaulting to always sending a message receipt request. Uh, there's a checkbox to disallow editing messages that are sent, uh, which um, prevents people from messing with them or altering them in any way. Um, th that was requested by a, a California hospital group that uh, has a, a policy that all messages must be read-only, they cannot be altered. So there are a bunch of options there you can use uh, if, you, um, if you want to, that you can set defaults. There's also a settings, there's a preference screen that has lots of options. You might explore that and look at some of them. Uh, one of them is to display a list of the pending messages prior to downloading them so you can see which messages are pending. If there's some really big message, you may not want to defer or might not want to download it right away. You might want to hold it till later because it just can take a while and you have other things you need to do. So you can turn that on. There are a bunch of other options there you can turn on. So that's under settings preferences, take a look at it and run through the list. Position reports. Uh, this is something built in that a lot of people don't know about. It was it's certainly very valuable for uh, offshore sailors, but it's valuable also for emergency communication. Uh, there's a, uh, a position report built into Winlink Express. The position report screen looks like this. You can manually enter a latitude and longitude and then file a position report. It's a specially formatted message that's generated for the position report that goes into a CMS, and then your position is shown on a map. Uh, but if you have a GPS dongle plugged in uh, where it can pick up the uh, position 
from the GPS, it'll automatically fill that in. So uh, to post a position report, you just use the position from the GPS rather than manually entering your latitude and longitude. Uh, the, shown on the right here is the Global Star BU353S4 is the, the GPS dongle I like. It's a really nice little unit. There, there are others that work just fine, but I, I like this one. It's a USB connected. It's powered through the USB. It's, it's, there's no on off. You just plug it in. It starts running. It's very reliable. It works indoors in my house. Not any problem. Uh, it costs, well, <laughs> the cost is kind of funny because for years, the cost was $26. And then I gave a presentation like this to another group that had 500 people on it. And I recommended it. And the next day, they sold out on Amazon. And then when it came back in stock, they bumped the price from twenty six to thirty three dollars. But I think it's I think it may have gone down to twenty six again. But after this meeting, it may jump up again. So you might want to grab and buy one first for everybody else buys them. Anyway, it's a nice little dongle. Just plug it in, and then position reports will be filled in automatically from it. Uh, this is a map uh, on the Winlink web server, uh, winlink.org forward slash user positions displays uh, markers where position reports have been filed. You can see there are a lot of sailors out there uh, in the Atlantic that have filed position reports and quite a clustering in, in Europe. If you click on one of the pins, it'll give you information, give you the call sign, uh, the time when the position report was posted and other information about it. So that's where your position report is actually displayed. Uh, Winley catalog requests. This is another feature that a lot of hams don't know about, but it's built into Express. Now, you call up the catalog request screen, which looks like this, and then on the in the left column there uh, are the categories of request. And you notice that I'm just scrolled part way down this list. That list goes on and on and on. And that's not the individual request, that's just the category of request. So I have chosen the category sat pics, satellite pictures. And when you choose a category from the list on the left, then the center panel is filled in with the uh, list of options for that category. So these are the list of options for satellite pictures. The top one that I have selected is the uh, infrared satellite image for the Gulf of Alaska, but there are lots of others in there. You can see that there, there are a huge number of choices. And you select one of those, double click it, and it'll put it over in the box of the right and then post request. It'll post the request for that particular catalog entry in your outbox. And then you, when you collected the ones you want to send, send them off to the CMS as regular WinLink messages. And then five or 10 minutes later, wait, and then connect to the CMS again and pull down a reply message that'll have an attachment with whatever you've requested. Here's an example of a, of a weather map that I requested using the catalog feature that was returned a few minutes later and that I displayed. It comes back as, a, I guess it's, a, it's either a JPEG or a GIF. I've forgotten which type of image that you can open up and, and view. So send your catalog request in, wait a few minutes, check again. You're going to get a reply back with an attachment of whatever you've requested. <clears throat> There's a, one of the catalog requests, which is kind of cool, is requests for the closest users. In other words, closest people that have posted a position report. And uh, I have, I posted a report previously requested a list of closest users. And I was the closest one, but down to you look at the bottom there, you can see I was close, I'm zero miles away. And then you can see some others, one 23.3 mile nautical, nautical miles away and 74, 78, 130. Uh, again, this is very useful for sailors when they, if they're in trouble, uh, they can find out if there are any other sailors that are close by who might be able to render assistance. But in emergency communication system a situation, it could be useful to see who else is, is around and posting messages to, if you need help during an emergency. 
There is a built-in picture editor in Winlink Express. You don't have to go to an external program. Uh, when you compose a message and attach a picture attachment to it, uh, there's an option to edit and or resize the picture. <clears throat> in this case, I had posted a rather large picture, beautiful picture of Statue of Liberty in Ellis, on Ellis Island and the pedestal underneath it. But it was really big. If you look down at the bottom right-hand corner of that, you see it says file size 127.5 kilobytes. Well, 127.5 kilobytes is just too big. So what I did was I selected uh, the uh, just the statue, just Lady Liberty there, and then click the, the crop button, and it cropped it down to Lady Liberty, who was much smaller, a reasonable size message. And I could send that via Winlink because I didn't need the entire image. So, and you, or if you wanted to send the entire thing, but it's still too big, then instead of cropping it down to a smaller part of the picture, you can just click resize and it'll reduce the resolution and shrink the picture down uh, to match whatever resolution or whatever size you specify. So I could have just taken this entire picture and said, okay, well, shrink, I'm willing to sacrifice some resolution, shrink it down to 30 KB, but send all of it. It would have done that. Very easy to use, built in, no external program needed. Okay, message templates and forms, a very important feature. Ed talked about the ICS uh, uh, 203 form, message standard message form. Uh, there are many, many forms built in to Express. And when you open a, a template list, you can select the form. <clears throat> Here's an example of a 213 form that uh, I selected, and it appears like this on your screen. You fill it in with the information. It looks just like the regular printed 213. Send this. Uh, it's sent in a very compact form. It doesn't send all of the entire form. It just sends the information in the fields. <clears throat> and on the receiving end, it fills it in and re receiving and gets a form that looks just like this. They can print it out. And as it looks beautiful, it looks just like a printed 213 form. A new form that it was added fairly recently is a form for a U.S. Geologic Survey, USGS. It's an earthquake report. It's called Do You Feel It or DYFI form. It's, it's a form you can fill in after an earthquake, uh, telling information like you didn't, you felt it or you didn't feel it. It did damage or it didn't do, do damage. It stopped your vehicle. Uh, you were in a moving vehicle, you were in a building, it damaged the building, building and so forth, so on. You can fill that in and then submit it. And one of the interesting things about this, when you submit it, it goes to USGS and it is automatically processed by their server when it comes in and entered in their database. So uh, we, we've worked out a connection between the Winlink system and the USGS uh, processors, which makes it possible for WinLink message form submissions to be processed automatically and go directly in their database without, without requiring an operator on the other end to manually enter all this information. They, it's, the earthquake reports by WinLink is very important because, of course, when you have a bad earthquake, it tends to knock out all other communications. Cell phones go, internet goes, everything else goes. So. Being able to submit by Winlink is is very very useful, and by the way, they they like reports that you did not feel it. Uh, if you're in an earthquake zone and earthquake occurs, but you didn't feel it, they like to know that too because then they can mark the perimeter of where the shaking stopped and get a, a better image of how extensive it was. When you're if you're using forms, you and you there's some that you use repeatedly. Let's say an ICS 213 standard message form, you can set it as a favorite template, in which case it shows up on the uh, the, the the message the menu bar for the message composition screen on on the right hand panel. You can see how, that I selected ICS 213 as one of my as my number one favorite template. And once I've set that up as a favorite template, then when I click the button to compose a new message, on right on the screen there where I type in the message, up the top you see ICS 213. 
shown, and I can just click that button to open up a 213 to enter the information I want to send. So if you're using the same forms over and over again, the 213 or uh, did you feel it form or whatever, uh, you just set it as a saver template and then boom, it's right there on the composition screen to make it real easy to select. Uh, Ed mentions the ICS 309 message log form. Uh, which is a standard communication log showing all the messages you send and receive when you're an operator of a in, a, in, a, in an incident. Well, built into Winlink Express is an automatic 309 PDF message log generator. Uh, at the end of your shift, <clears throat> you tell it to generate a 309. You select the date, date and time range that you want to go into your 309, fill in things like the task ID, task name, your operator name, station ID, and so forth. And then you get a nice looking, very professional, generated 309 PDF file. An example is on the right. <clears throat> you know, I've seen some 309s generated uh, during exercises uh, manually, and they're almost unreadable. People are scribbling in pencils or or pens that bleed. Uh, their handwriting's terrible. You know, they turn them in. They're almost useless because you can't read them when they turn them in. But if you're a Winlink operator and generate this PDF file, it looks beautiful, looks very professional. Uh, you can print it out or you can just email it to the um, comail at the end of the, of the incident. Uh, I just throw this in. It's not specifically for merge communication, uh, but since there, since we have a lot of gray hair and no hair in this group, uh, I think there's quite a few people getting to be my age. That uh, you know, being able to change the font is a is a nice feature. There's something which is added within the last few months, but there's a setting where you can select the font for your the text of messages or for list. And you can pick the font you like, including increasing the size of it. So if you're having problems reading these little Winlink messages, just go into settings, font size, and crank up the size to something you can read. What's the future? Well, certainly we anticipate continued growth of civil agency support, including shares. Uh, we already have something in the range of 90 standard forms built in. and they add new forms uh, virtually every week. Uh, we're adding features based on incidents and exercises feedback. We see a slow phase out of Winmore and RDOP on HF and bar HF is going to grow. Bar FM very popular already and continuing to become even more popular. Uh, we might make some Winlink programs open source, still talking about that. One of our, uh, our members, Rick Muthing, uh, KN6KB, has, is is developing a channel simulator device uh, based on a um, microprocessor. You feed in a signal on one end, it comes out the other end, and you can again, introduce uh, varying amounts of noise. You can add all sorts of different kinds of distortion to it. And it's a wonderful tool for testing the performance of protocols uh, in noisy channel conditions. That's what we use to produce those charts and tables I showed earlier about how these different protocols hold up under a reduced signal to noise ratio. Uh, we're, we've, we've added a lot of features over the last year to try to keep hams legal. You know, ultimately, the, the, the legal responsibility falls with the control operator of a station, but it's really helpful to know that you're transmitting uh, out of the legal range. And so we've added a lot of frequency range checks. So for example, if you are a US ham and you uh, see a very attractive Canadian RMS, which looks great, and you're about ready to connect and send a message to that Canadian RMS or a Mexican one, well, that Canadian RMS may be running on perfectly legal frequencies in Canada, but that may be out of the legal frequency range for U.S. hams. And when you are about to do that, a message is going to pop up and saying, whoops, whoops, before you do that, uh, you might want to consider the fact that you're operating out of frequency and violating the FCC rules. Are you sure you want to continue and make this connection? It'll warn you. So that'll help keep you legal. Uh, it's a nice reminder uh, to keep honest people honest. 
Okay, I'm going to wrap it up here. Let's talk about preparing yourself for MCOM. You know, it's one thing to learn how to use WinLink and have all these wonderful features in it, but how about preparing yourself? Well, J.J. Johnson, who is a, uh, some of you may know, he is a MCOM professional in Tennessee who has been around for a long time, came up with a, a formula for successful emergency communication equals I equals parenthesis 2P plus 2T close parenthesis times R. And what that stands for is I is interoperability, which is what communication is, is equal to planning plus policy plus training plus technology and all of that multiplied by relationships. So if you look at that formula, if R is zero, then I is zero. It doesn't matter how good your planning and policy, training and technology are. If you have no relationships, you're not going to have functional interoperability. And relationships is something that is emphasized over and over again there in the MCOM world. Uh, a statement which I've heard many times from Mike Harris at TEMA, the ESF2 uh, person, is when times are good, people work with people they know. When times are bad, people work with people they know. Relationships are key. If you, if, if you are not known, if you have not established a relationship with an agency, it's extremely unlikely they will use you during an incident. They can't they can't just have people walking in they've never met and dispatch them out to some shelter where they're representing them. You've got to be known. They've got to have some faith and trust in you. So relationships, building up relationships is absolutely essential. Another statement is when you need a friend, it's too late to make a friend. Build relationships before incidents occur. As Ed said, the minimum ICS training, ICS 100, 200, 700, 800, if you haven't done that, that's very important. You need to do that. They're all online courses, doesn't take long. You'll learn a lot. I highly recommend taking the classroom classes, ICS 300, which I think is the absolute most important one of all of these classes. It's a three or four day class. You'll be rubbing shoulders with MCOM professionals. You'll learn a lot about ICS. You really come out knowing it. ICS 400 is a more advanced version of that. And then there's communication leader and communication technician, which are interesting and fun classes to take. In addition to learning of these things, you'll also develop relationship with MCOM professionals who are in those classes with you. There are also, there are OXCOM courses and the training is good from OXCOM, but the differences with ICS courses like ICS 300 and 400, that that training is required by the people who are at agencies. So when you take an ICS 300 course, you're gonna be rubbing shoulders and on a team and working with people who are professionals at agencies and develop, developing relationships with them. If you take an OXCOM course, you can be rubbing shoulders and developing relationships with other hams. Well, the relationship with other hams is good, but it's mighty nice to make uh, contacts with and develop relationships with the real professionals who are working at the agencies. Participate in exercises whenever possible. Keep your system updated and tested. Practice, 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 and send communication often. If your system hasn't been dusted off and used in the last six months, it's not going to work. <laughs> that's my general rule of thumb. If it hasn't been used in six months, it's not gonna work. So that's it. Uh, I'm here, Steve is here, Laura's not here today. Uh, but we'll be happy to answer questions if we have time. And Ed, I'm going to try to figure out how to, how to turn it back to you if I can do that. Let's see here. Okay. All right. We had we had several questions and answers floating around, but we had one question other than using parallels or, or VM, whatever. Is there any plan to make this system where it will run on native Mac? No. Okay. Simple answer, no. <laughs> okay. You know, there's ways to use it on a Mac, but without the parallels, you know, you can't do it. So, okay. Uh, Phil, you want to unshare your screen? Okay. Let's see. How's that? There, there you go. You did okay. it. Okay. All right. Any other questions for Phil? 
Uh, Phil, we had one other question you might want to respond to. Gary asked, where does the VARA encoder reside in the PC running Winlink? Well, it's actually in, uh, in Winlink Express. You get it there. So you want to... Well, you, 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 you download a program from the VARA website. It's, right. in, it's actually in Spain and installed <laughs> on your computer. It install, installs in a folder, uh, the C colon backslash VARA folder. And then when Winlink, when you open a VARA session in Winlink Express, Winlink Express launches that VARA program, which is the actual encoder. That's the, the TNC, the encoder for VARA. So Winlink Express then talks to the VARA program and uh, controls it. It tells it who to call. Uh, receives messages back from it, like I've connected or disconnected, or uh, things like that. So it's a communication. It's a link. It's a combination cooperation between Winlink Express and the VARA program that you download. Okay. Uh, before we go to the Shack tour, <clears throat> excuse me. Any other questions for Phil? I have a question, Ed. Bob. Yeah, Bob. Um. You, you you presented information about the speed of Pactor 4. Uh, I thought Pactor 4 was out of bounds for hams. Is it that is. Easy? It is. It is in the United States, but it's not for others. But but it's used a lot by shares. Shares uses Pactor 4 almost exclusively. And that test and those numbers I presented were actually done using that, that HF channel simulator that Rick is developing. So we, d we can do the measurements, and, and if you're a ham outside the United States, you can use Pactor 4, or if you're operating on the shares frequencies, you can use Pactor 4. So yeah, Pactor 4 is still an important protocol, it's just that because of the stupid uh, ancient uh, FCC rules, US hams can't use it. But thank you. Phil, I have a quick question. Peer-to-peer -peer operation on uh, on VARA FM, for instance, mm -hmm. what, what is required on the receiving end? Does it need to be online at the time? I assume it would. Yeah, yeah that's right. And that's that's the, the disadvantage of peer-to-peer. -peer. Well, there are several disadvantages. One is that both stations have to be on the air at the same time. They have to be on the same frequency. Somehow, somehow you've got to coordinate what frequency you're going to be on and you know arrange to be there at the same time. Uh, and of course, you also have to have direct propagation between the stage two stations. When you're operating in conventional Winlink mode, where you're sending a message into an RMS that then goes to a CMS where it's held until it's picked up later, you don't have those restrictions. You don't have to be on there at the same time. You don't have to be on the same frequency. You don't have to be the same protocol. You can send the message in using Pactor, and the receiving end can pick it up using VARA. It doesn't matter, or FM. So it, you know, the, the the conventional win link gives you much more flexibility than peer to peer. All right, uh, VARA FM is really uh, a good good mode. I I was disenchanted with the uh, old system, so hard to connect, but uh, really enthusiastic now. Yeah. Thank you. And VARA HF is great if you're on the HF bands. I am. Yeah. Ed. Yeah. Ed. One more thing. Yeah, Jeff. Yeah, I just don't let everybody know. We got a good crowd here. Uh, there are some WCARES members that are checking in to a Florida Winlink net every week. Right. Uh, yeah, try again now. Okay, okay. Um, anyway, every week you send a message to, uh, let's see, it's Whiskey 4 Alpha Kilo Hotel. Uh, and there's a format that he wants that in. I guess if, if we want to put it out on the website, we can. But anyway, we uh, send one one link message via RDOP, VAR, uh, VARA used to be Winmore, but not anymore. Uh, and it's just a great exercise to, to keep you up on one link. Make sure, like Bill said, make sure your equipment's working and everything. Uh, but anyway, I just want to throw that out there. Uh, can I uh, also add that the uh, California Office of Emergency Services has a monthly WinLink net. You can uh, check into that net um, anytime during the month 
you send a message to California at winlink.org, and there's a template, a great opportunity to use a template. Um, and you go to the general template, you go to the California templates, and you will see a check-in template. Uh, anybody that can't find it, if you e email me, Steve Waterman, K4CJX at Comcast.net, I'll direct you right to it. I don't remember exactly where it is. But uh, you just fill out the template and send the template uh, into the outbox and then uh, send a message over whatever media you wish using Winlink Express, and they would really appreciate a check-in. Um, you'll get a copy of uh, the number of people that check into that when it, uh, when it occurs once a month. That's uh, just another way to practice. Yeah. Thank you. 